This is the uh, first Sunday of Be the Church. We've been working toward this for a while. Uh, we had uh, an incredible run on the devotional books last Sunday, and we've reordered. And you ought to, if you didn't pick one up already, you ought to have one available to you today, and uh, you can get caught up on the devotional readings. But we welcome you to Be the Church. Won't you? Because this is, we're talking, about, we're talking about community and loving one another. Why don't you turn to somebody next to you and say, I'm glad you're here. Okay, now for those of you who couldn't do that with, with a clear conscience, just turn to somebody next to you and say, I'm okay with you being here. I'm just, I can live, I can learn to live with it if it's only for an hour or so. We'll be fine. All right. Because we're working on it, right? We're working on it. <laughs> All right, Acts chapter 2. Now, while you're turning there, I want to tell you a story. Some of you, a couple different venues, I've told this story as a part of my testimony, and especially testimony about church. Before Rhonda and I got married, I was at Southwestern Seminary, and uh, one of my college roommates, dad, lived in Fort Worth, where I was going to seminary, and he was a bivocational pastor, like the majority of pastors in Texas, they have a job, full-time job all week, and then on weekends, they're leading a, leading a church, and that is some of the greatest ministry that takes place in the country, the bivocational pastor. Well, his name was Bill. Yeah, Bill Dollar, how about that? Bill Dollar, as opposed to Dollar Bill, he was Bill Dollar. And uh, he's a great guy, and such an encourager to me, and uh, he... He asked me on more than one occasion, hey, could you, could you supply preach at the little church I pastor? He'd be out of town, something would come up, and so he'd have me go out. So it was just west of Fort Worth, a, a country church. And the first time I went out was my most memorable. Uh, I revisited this same scenario every time I went out. And I think I've supplied for him three or four times. We'd go out there. I'd go out there by myself. I'd get there early the first time because he said, oh, you don't want to miss this. There are two things. I want you to preach the sermon. Now, they'll take care of everything else. They'll, they'll do the welcome. They'll do the announcements. They'll do the music. They'll, do, they'll close the service. You just have to preach the sermon. They'll point to you when it's your turn. But uh, I want you to watch for something, too. Just, just come back and tell me anything unusual, anything out of the ordinary that you, that you notice. So this is just a dream come true for me. I, I'm going to preach the sermon. And I'm also a secret shopper, so it's just the best of both worlds. And so I arrived early, and it's a country church. I still love the country churches where you can go any time during the week, and it's unlocked. And so I got there early. I was the first one at the building. I pulled up and uh, walked in. I prayed around the building, thought through my sermon again, and then people started coming in. So here come, here come the folks. And they were so gracious to me. Uh, some of my most, most favorite experiences, especially early in ministry, are supply preaching in small country churches. And I did a lot of it during those, uh, those years in college and seminary. Folks, they're, they're, they welcome me, they affirm me, they encourage me, young seminary student preparing to be a pastor. And it's, it's a great experience. By the time everybody came in, I'd already seen what he wanted me to see. I'd already spotted it. When we dismissed, it was even more apparent exactly what he wanted me to see. Everybody came in. Hello, you must be Brother Chad. We're so glad you're here to preach the word to us today. And they, they, were, they were grace. Everybody came in. But here was the thing. All these people coming in. And they were, there were hugs. And there were handshakes. And there were kisses. And there were welcomes. And how you doing? And how did that go last week? And checking in on each other. And at the end of the service, it was the same thing. You're going to go to lunch somewhere? Why don't you come over to the house and have some lunch with us? What are you going to be doing this afternoon? Why don't we get together tonight for some ice cream down at the Dairy Queen? It was all those, all those kind of dynamics going on all around. But here's, here's what Bill had wanted me to see. All that dynamic, all those people loving each other and caring for one another. But that church seated about 100 people, and there were probably 75 of them there, and it had a middle aisle. And all that loving and caring and asking took place on this side and on this side, but there was nothing happening across the aisle. There were two groups of people there. Uh, it was Hatfields and McCoys. 
And Bill told me later a little bit of the dynamics of it. Church domin- a, lot, a lot of small churches, church dominated by two families. And those two families had gotten crossways somewhere along the way. And they had their family, an extended family, each of them on each side. And they had friends who had sided with them on each side. But nothing came across that aisle. They were, they were friendly and warm and personable to me. And as long as you're on the, this side or that side, to one another. But I don't think that's quite what God intends for the church. That, well, I, I have my group, I have my little gang, but I'm not worried about anybody else's stuff. Uh, it, it's us together. The church united. The church, the church in community. I was not surprised, by the way, when at the end of the service, I went ahead and went to the door and they did one more announcement and then said, all right, we are not going to sing. We are one in the bond of love and hold hands across the aisles. Uh, I was not surprised that did not happen. Now, this little adventure we're calling Be the Church, it's a 30-day church challenge. What we want to do is we want to deepen our relationship with God, deepen our relationships with one another. And discover really what the church is meant to be. Uh, we, we settle for whatever works for us, church. Whatever is easy, church. And God's calling us to a bigger vision for church than that. He's calling us to, to, to live church the way, I, I think, the way it was lived out in the second chapter of Acts when the church at Jerusalem was being the church together. A lot of the frustrations and shortcomings, and I know some of you say, well, I've had a, bad, a lot of bad experiences with churches. Well, me too. I have a bad experience with some of you guys sometimes. We, we have a wonderful, warm church here. I have been in churches where that was not the case. I have a lot of pastor friends where it is not the case. It, it is a battle royal. And, uh, but when we, when we deal with church... One of the breakdowns is we try to play what is a team sport as individuals. Does that make sense? Like for me, I grew up, I was born in Victoria, Texas. I grew up about five miles outside the city limits. And that was just getting me to the edge of town. So we didn't have a lot around us, a lot to do. Uh, We had a driveway, uh, concrete driveway my dad had poured himself and he got his uh, welding machine out and he made me a basketball goal for that driveway and and I played basketball a lot on that driveway because there wasn't a lot else to do in Victoria Texas in a pre-electronics day and you had to have good weather and the planets aligning right to be able to get tv reception out of San Antonio with a tv antenna so it, it was a lot of basketball on the driveway and I became fairly proficient on my driveway I could shoot from anywhere on that driveway. I taught myself to dribble on that driveway and to do different things, do different skill sets, skill sets that I developed on the driveway, but I didn't get very proficient at basketball until I got some, I got some intentional coaching and I started playing with other people. It was amazing how other people changed the dynamics of basketball for me. I got better and I found out all the places where I wasn't very good. Uh, there were a lot of adjustments to be made. A lot of people are, are approaching the Christian life, which is a team sport, as if it's an individual sport. All of our focus ends up being on me and God when the Bible's overwhelming, overwhelming testimony to what uh, the people of God are about. If it's in the Old Testament, it's the people of God or the church in the New Testament. It's we and God. You think about things even like the model prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Almost every prayer in the New Testament is a plural. Not because it's a, oh, well, we're making it a general prayer because that's how prayer works. It's God's people together praying. Almost every, every example of prayer is a together thing. Almost every example of what it means to live the Christian life is a we and God. And so that's why often just a thought process that's out of whack. We, we start thinking, ah, I think I can do this on my own. We're self-sufficient and self-reliant. We don't think we need 
We need one another. If you're not in biblical community, focused on Jesus, anchored on the authority of God's word, this thing's going to start to break down on you quickly. So, (laughs) who asks you tough questions when you choose to sin? Who shares your joys when God's blessing? Who, Who speaks the gospel of grace when you fail? Who do you pray with when you feel alone, shaken in your faith? This is the we and God part of the Christian faith. The power of community binds us together and enables us to do things we never would have attempted on our own. I have have done things in in the name of the Lord with much greater boldness when I had somebody with me. You know how that goes. When you're not by yourself, you're not afraid to maybe share your faith because it's not just you. And, and, And when it's an act of service, you're not... You're not as timid about doing it when you have a partner with you going side by side that we are in this together. There is power in, in we when it comes to the Christian life. We are better at this when we tackle challenges together. And that's why we're doing this church-wide. We want to learn the same things from God's Word, apply the same truths, taking the same steps, and we'll do it better and faster if we do this together. And that's why we do coordinated campaigns like this. Here's the other thing. This is a big deal in a multi-generational church like ours, the size of ours. This effort strengthens our unity in Christ. Because community, a big part of community is unity. All of us together, lean in the same directions at the same time for God's greater purpose for us. Uh, Think about it this way. A.W. Tozer has this illustration. He says, has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same tuning fork are automatically tuned to each other. They are of one accord by being tuned not to each other, but to another standard to which each one must individually bow. So 100 worshipers meeting together, each one looking away to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be, where they to become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God to strive for closer fellowship. It's the the same idea we talk about in marriage. How do you strengthen your marriage? The closer the two of you grow to Christ, husbands and wives, the closer you get to one another. And you can try to, uh, tools are great, suggestions are great, but your relationship to Christ is what grows your marriage. It's the greatest bond in your marriage. It's what will carry you when everything gets hard and dark in marriage. And it's true in a church family. The closer we are to God, leaning in the same direction at the same time. The more unified we are in Christ, the more focused we are on things, and the more we're going to love one another. Now, here's what we're doing during this thing. Monday through Saturday, prior to this Sunday message, we'll all be reading a short daily devotional. Hopefully most of you got a book. Sorry that we ran out last week. You overwhelmed us with your, your response to this, for which we are most grateful. We're somewhere, goodness, uh, seven, 800 books at least. This is going to be a short daily devotional each day, and we have been so blessed. Our staff's been doing this together as a church staff, and have been blessed and challenged by it. The devotional gives you a simple step to take each day, because see, it's not just about what you know, it's about what you do. That's what really shows what you're learning, where you're growing, so it gives you something to do each day. And What we want to do is we want to transform our church into a community that's being transformed by Jesus, that can then transform our world. The objective of this is to come to the end of this journey and, and we, we get to a spot, and really, this is where most people stop, is I come to church, I attend church, to, to be the church, to engage in the body of Christ in a significant way under the power of the gospel. That's where we want to arrive, and Here's an example of that from Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42. It says, this is at the end of uh, the birthday of the church. and What came out of Pentecost? And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul. And, every, and, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and, and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God 
having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. So everything we're going to talk about in the next five Sundays are going to relate to one of these core devotions that the church demonstrated in Acts chapter 2. And it is, it is more than head knowledge. As, as American Christians, we have a gravitational pull toward head knowledge as the end game. That we know stuff. But this is about heart change in the Bible. It's about being transformed. Not just knowing more stuff. But what are you doing with what you have learned? So, according to this passage, there are five foundational areas. And these are things we'll address together as a church family. We're going to cultivate authentic community. Experience worship as a part of a daily lifestyle. Take successive steps of spiritual growth. Practice personal stewardship. To learn to be generous with our whole life to God and to reach out to the world around us. So those are the challenges we're trying to master over the next five weeks. And the first is cultivating authentic community. And the Acts 2 church excelled in that. That they devoted themselves to the church. And when it says the church, it's not the institution. It's not the building, the gathering place. It's the family. It's dedicating themselves, devoting themselves to each other. Last week, we learned that one of the things that made the first church in Jerusalem so special was that the people made time for relationships. And that's the breakdown in a lot of this, of being a family of faith, is we don't take time, we don't set aside time to do this. But this is what we find in Acts 2. Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to fellowship. Verse 44, they held everything in common. Verse 46, they broke bread together in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They, they cultivated authentic community. And this is a, that's a key word. It's a good farming term, cultivated. And it means this does not happen by accident. It doesn't happen just because you snap your fingers. You have to work at it. Uh, I have a flower bed just outside our back patio. It's full of all sorts of fascinating plant life. None of it seems to be intentional. And that is true. It's all just happened. Over the last couple of months. I'd worked at it for a while. and haven't worked at it in a while. It's a shameful display back there. Of uh, disregard and disrepair. Now. When. When you think about cultivating something. Okay here's my flower bed. I can throw some little plants. In the general direction of that. And hope for the best. But that's really not what God, what, what, what's going to make a nice flower bed. And it's not what God intends for his church. But you have to develop a, an environment that's conducive to growth. The, to, to the productivity of, of what's taking place. It's true in a, in a garden setting and it's true in a church setting. They worked at this. They cultivated it. One of the things you discover when you get involved in a in a Bible teaching church is that the church isn't a building you go to it's a family you belong to and for us the center of church life at First Baptist Church Allen is the Bible fellowship groups that's how and church is organized in different ways and I'm not saying that others are wrong but we got churches all around us that focus on the crowd that's the primary goal is a crowd we focus on community and that's why we run as many and sometimes more in Bible fellowship groups than we do in a worship hour. Because we said, you're not connected to God. And you're not connected to God's purpose for your life until you're in community. And that's just a value we have that sets us apart from some other places. It may be different than what you're accustomed to. But we're going to study spiritual truth together. And in the process, we come to know and be known and love and be loved and serve and be served and celebrate and be celebrated and how do you experience the church in that kind of community three things I want to touch on just quickly here's the first one you make time for it and this is where it breaks down for a lot of people uh, not making time for it you commit to an intentional group of people on a weekly basis now you can be in any kind of group and any number of groups in the community You're with people, but they're not intentionally bringing you closer to Christ or seeking to grow you in Christ. This is an intentional group of people with those sorts of priorities. And what it means is you you make this a priority. You're going to show up for your group every week. You're going to show up for what's taking place at your church. You're going to be a part of a family at church. You're going to prioritize this. 
We have so many other things that are attractive to us, that are available to us, that we can go a hundred different directions on any given Lord's Day. And, and the challenge for us, <laughs> it's not a question in the persecuted church. Persecuted church, they'll sneak, sneak to their place of gathering in the middle of the night at the risk of their lives because they recognize the value of community. We have uh, lost a lot of that. In day one of your 30-day church challenge devotional book, you read about David and Jonathan. So here's David and Jonathan. They're a couple of busy guys. Jonathan is the heir apparent to the throne of Israel, the son of Saul. He has great responsibility and a lot of commitments on his plate. David is the commander-in-chief of Saul's army. Again, with huge responsibility, a lot of pressure on him. And yet these two men, they recognize the value of of a spiritual community, of being together, of having a relationship that carried beyond, beyond a work relationship for sure. They made time for each other in the midst of all those responsibilities. And both of them were better men for it and more godly because of it. Because relationships don't just happen, you need to deliberately make time for them. You can't have deep relationships flying through life 100 miles an hour. Deep relationship is not a, a text or a tweet or Facebook post. It's, it's spending time together. It's going through life together. You cultivate those authentic relationships. And you, you can't have a you can't have a hundred deep relationships, but you can cultivate a few very deep relationships. The depth of relationship is based on the depth of what you share in common. If what you share in common with someone else is a deep abiding appreciation for apple pie, more power to you. I have people in my life that that's what we share most in common. But they're not my close friends and they're not the people that are going through life with me. But if you share in common a relationship to God through His Son, Jesus Christ, you're talking about an eternally impactful relationship potential. And so lean into that relationship. Our first week's challenge in the 30-day church challenge is to commit to joining a group to be a part of an intentional group of believers who are seeking to do this together. So, for the purpose to experience authentic community. And I want to encourage you, dedicate yourself to being in your group once a week for the next five weeks. Second thing, if you're going to do this, you need to contribute to it. And I say this because there are people, you can come to your class every week. You can be a part of a, of a group that's an intentional group every week. But you're just sitting there as a casual observer. You're not engaged. You're not a part of it. You're not leaning into what God has for you. You're not leaning into the people in the room. A good group bonds and gels when the members of the group make a conscious effort to be contributors to the group. You're not just drifting in and out anonymously. You know how this works. You can sit there and in the next hour you can be in a group. It's a group you're in every week and it is rolling and conversation is popping and people are contributing and they're sharing significant things and you're sitting there and for all they know you're all in but really you're still thinking about what I said about apple pie and you haven't been able to go past that you're still just thinking about work this next week or you're thinking about activities that you need to do this afternoon something else is standing between you and engaging and what we want to challenge you to do is to engage and that means that Sometimes you risk and you share something. It means that you have grace and you listen. It means that when, when people are hurting, you pray. But the bottom line is you learn to do life together. And you speak the truth and you do it in love. And you make each other's lives better as a result of it. But you need to engage. And I want to challenge some of you who never... Never engage with the other people. Who You're just sitting there in the corner watching it happen. Just take a step of faith. Third thing is you take a genuine interest in the lives of others. This is often easier for women than for men because men tend to compartmentalize a lot of stuff. But, but men, at least during your group, and women during your group, I'm going to ask you to take a genuine interest in what's going on in the life of the other people in the group. Uh, when, it, when you get to your daily prayer time and one of the habits we want to develop because that daily devotional over 30 days is develop a daily time with God. So in your daily time with God, think back to what, you what was talked about in the group. If you're not good, for me, 
I mean, I'm standing in front of you and talking to a bunch of people, but I'm a severe introvert. So this, I'm the introverted pastor. So this is, it's always a stretch for me to engage, to walk across the room, to do that. So what I've found is that when I feel a distance with someone or I want to develop a relationship with someone, I start praying for them. And when you start praying for people every day, like, okay, somebody shares something, a real heart something in, in, your, in your group today, start praying for them this week and pray for them every day. And by next Sunday, when you see them, you feel like, I know, I know you. I've, I've been connected to you all week long, and it builds a bridge that wouldn't be there otherwise. So take, take advantage of those kinds of next steps. Here's the thing. Our default inclination, all of us, is always towards selfishness. I mean, you know this is true. It's always towards selfishness. I, I'm concerned about me, uh, but I'm, I'm not that interested in what's going on with other people. And I care about my story and my challenges, but I don't, I don't have time to hear about yours. Well, self-centeredness doesn't build relationships. Take time and effort. In Philippians, Paul said, let each of you not only look out to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Okay. So, is there a real advantage to this? And, and I recognize a lot of you, oh, I've been doing church for a long time, and I've never really had that happen, and that's why, that's why I'm trying everything else first, or I'm trying everything else instead of. And I want to throw out an example to you, and I'd like for you to, to open your Bibles to one of the shortest chapters in the Bible, Psalm 133. And uh, the, the book of Psalms in the, is right in the middle of your Bible, I'm going to change my configuration here. So Psalm 133 is uh, one of the shortest chapters in the Bible. It's just about in the middle of your Bible. And Psalm 133 is something David wrote. It's one of the Psalms of Ascent. And the Psalm of Ascent, there's a set of them right in this section of the Psalms. And there's songs that were collected, and they're used so that when the people are going up to Jerusalem for the different feast and festival days, they'd sing this as they went along on the journey. And because uh, you always, whether you're coming from the north or the south, you always go up in the Bible when you're going to Jerusalem. And so it's a psalm of ascent. And David wrote this. Now, here's the thing about David. David understood what community was and how valuable it was because... There's, there's a lot of story in the Bible about David and his mighty men, that he was surrounded by this group of men, that they, they went through life together spiritually, through the challenges, whatever life had, he went through it with these guys. So he understood the value of community. And this Psalm of Ascent is telling that story. And this is what he says. The first verse is self-explanatory. This one's really clear. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Brothers, they weren't uh, acquaintances, they weren't fellow soldiers, they were his brothers. And the word he uses, unity, we could use the word community. Because he's not just talking about getting along so we don't kill each other. He's talking about, he's talking about being together, having that Acts 2 sort of relationship. Okay, so this is how wonderful, how blessed... How pleasant and good when brothers dwell in unity. And then he gives two examples. It's like, and this is when it all goes crazy. It's like precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. So this is one of those spots. You say, okay, verse 1 made great sense. But then oil running through somebody's beard is not particularly attractive to me. And it, this is this Herman Munster. Who is, who is Herman in this illustration? And why is he sitting out in the yard getting dew all over him? Well, here's the story. So there are, two, there are two main leaders in the country of Israel when David writes this. One is David. He's the king. And then there's the high priest. Now the high priest, he's a big deal. He's the spiritual leader of the nation. 
the high priest, he has great influence. Uh, he, he represents to God, God's people. Once a year, he's going to go into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. And he's going to offer sacrifice on the Day of Atonement for the sins of the nation. Uh, he, he's a significant leader. Now, not anybody could be high priest. It was a hereditary position. So it, had, it was father to son. Always from the tribe of Levi, but not just from the tribe of Levi. You had to be a direct descendant of Aaron, the first high priest. Remember Aaron, Aaron, the brother of Moses. So it's a big deal. This position is for life. Your high priest for life. Well, when a new high priest was going to be anointed, it's a, it's a big happening. And what would happen is the whole nation would come together for this event. There was this special anointing oil that was prepared. It was di there are different anointing oils in the Old Testament. Different formulas, different spices mixed with the oil to create the fragrance that is going to be a part of the anointing. This, the only time this was used, when they're anointing the, high, the new high priest. So it's a big deal. A lot of people, they go the, the whole lifetime, they might be a part of one anointing of a high priest. So, everybody comes up to Jerusalem for this. It's, a, it's an exciting time. Because this, we, we are setting apart the spiritual leader of our nation. And we're saying that God's hand is upon him. Oil always... Uh, a symbol of the presence of God, presence of the Holy Spirit in a person. Uh, the power of God, the covering of God, that's the anointing oil. And so what they would do, they'd get this guy up there. And they didn't just put a dab of this anointing oil on him. Because it's a big job and it's for a lifetime. And they would take a generous portion of this anointing oil. And after prayers and ceremony, they would take this take this high priest and they would pour the oil over his head and it would run down over his hair and through his beard and over, over this high priestly robe and the smell of, this is stout smelling stuff too. Uh, just a slight breeze and it's going to cover a crowd and they'd remember. They'd remember how special it was, and they'd remember that special scent of the high priestly anointing oil, maybe the only time in their life that they'd experience it. And what David says is, what is, what is it like to live in unity with your brothers, to live in spiritual community? He said, well, I'll tell you what it's like. It's like a once-in-a-lifetime experience as the people of God come together, wrapped around a cause, a purpose that is so very special. That's what it's like to live in a spiritual community as God's people. It's coming together, except instead of just once in your lifetime, every time you gather, it has that, that special nature to it, that preciousness, that this is so different than everything else kind of feel. Then he says, or it's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. Now, the land of Israel is a dry place most of the time. A real short rainy season. Uh, I, was, I was watching a Smithsonian Institution TV special. It was on Masada. And uh, some of you had the opportunity maybe to visit Masada. It overlooks the Dead Sea, the mountain fortress, and the last holdout against the Roman army by the Jewish people. It's a, it's a powerful story. And I think they said there were over a dozen cisterns up on top of Masada. One of them, the largest one, I've walked down into. And it said to hold, they showed it on the, on the program. It's said to hold about a million gallons of water. When it rains in that short rainy season, these cisterns, and you see cisterns mentioned all through the Old Testament. They had all kinds of elaborate gutter systems and things. That when it rained, everything went into the cistern and it could be stored. It, you could keep that water. But most of the year, there is no water to be had except from one natural source, Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon's way up in the northern end of the land of Israel. And Mount Hermon is tall enough and positioned well enough. This is a, this is a great uh, Christmas trivia question. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, did anyone in Israel have a white Christmas? 
Yes, Mount Hermon always, always has snow on it. Uh, it's uh, always snow covered. There's uh, ski runs on Mount Hermon today. So, the, the winds coming off the Mediterranean, coming from the west toward the east, they get to Mount Hermon and it collects moisture. It'll rain there, it'll snow up on top, and it becomes a, a source of water. And so all during the year, what happens is water comes off of Hermon. And it runs down, it, it's, it creates three uh, different streams, and they gush uh, down from Mount Hermon. Three different streams, it forms into, into an area and then leads into the Sea of Galilee. And then it comes out the southern end of the Sea of Galilee as the Jordan River. And the Jordan River then empties into the Dead Sea. When, when you read about springs in the Old Testament, and they found a spring, and there was a spring here and a spring there, every spring from Jerusalem north, just about, is coming from Mount Hermon. It's water that ends up going underground and pops up somewhere to create water and to create life in a desert. Jerusalem is, it says Zion. Jerusalem is built on Mount Zion. So that's what the water makes it all the way to God's uh, special place. And so what David says is, to dwell together in unity with, with spiritual brothers, it's like the life-giving water that comes off of Mount Hermon. When, there's, a, there's a passage where Paul talks to Philemon and he says, the people have been refreshed by Philemon. He says, it's like that. It's where there couldn't be life otherwise. When we come together, there's life and there's joy and there's help and there's hope all because of, of us coming together. Just like a desert, would, there, life would die without that life-giving water coming off of Mount Hermon. The same is true for relationship to God. We would, we would be a spiritual desert if we didn't have one another. To bring that refreshing, that blessing, that hope. That's what it means to be a part of a community of believers. Now, to experience, to experience community, that's going to require some things of us. And we talked about some things that it would require of us, and things we would need to do. Why don't we experience this this way? Well, the reason we don't experience it this way is because we substitute other things. That's, that's really our our go-to move to avoid doing what God wants us to do. We say, well, I could find my joy and my purpose and my happiness and all that in, in the people of God wrapped around the cross of Christ and the purposes for which God has created me, but I think I can do it by being a part of this group or this activity or this thing my kids are doing or this thing that uh, seems interesting and engaging and we'll substitute a thousand one other things for Christian community. Because we're desperate for the community, but we try to do it any way but what God said. And what we want to challenge you to do is to say, maybe, maybe God knows what he's talking about. Wouldn't that be something if we really leaned into that? God may know better than I know. Do you ever say that to your children? You know, I may know more than you know. God says it to us. God says, I may know more than you know. I may have a better plan for your life than you have for your life. So would you be willing to try, to lean into it, to say, at least for this 30 days, I'm going to make my best effort, unless providentially hindered. I'm going to make my best effort to be, to be in the worship hours, to be in a group, whether it's on Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, Wednesday night, the different places where they're set up for you. And I'm going to do that daily devotional that's leaning into those two things uh, and preparing us for those two things. I'm going to do that every day, six days a week, uh, to see what God might be up to. And I'm going to really try community. I'm going to take a step of faith. Not just attending, not just being present, but engaging. Maybe opening up a little of your heart, see what God's up to, taking a step of faith, that people will care about you and love you and support you. And you might just find, 
You might just find, I don't know that you'd put this on your Facebook page, but wow, today in my community group, it was as good as oil running down Aaron's beard and dew coming off of Mount Hermon. But maybe you know a little more about that story than you used to, and maybe you'd find more value there than you ever realized possible. Let us love one another.